Hello everyone, this is Dr. Prashant and welcome back to my public health lecture series. In this video, I will be talking about the basics of research methodology. So to begin with the introduction, research refers to the systematic method consisting of enunciating the problem, formulating a hypothesis, collecting the facts or data, analyzing the facts and reaching certain conclusions either in the form of solutions towards the concerned problem or in certain generalizations for some theoretical formulation. And some of the objectives of research are to gain familiarity with the phenomenon or to achieve new insights into it. To portray accurately the characteristics of a particular individual, situation or a group. To determine the frequency with which something occurs or with which it is associated with something else. Or to test a hypothesis of a causal relationship between variables like smoking and cancer. There are different types of research. Let's look into each of them briefly. Descriptive and analytical research. Descriptive research includes surveys and fact-finding enquiries of different kinds. It is basically the description of the state of affairs as it exists at present. So we generally use the term exposed fact to research where the main characteristic feature is that researcher has no control over the variables. Whereas in analytical research, researchers has to use facts or information already available and analyze these to make a critical evaluation of the material. Applied or fundamental research. Applied research aims at finding a solution for an immediate problem facing a society or an industrial or business organization. Whereas fundamental or pure research is concerned with generalizations and with the formulations of a theory. Coming to quantitative or qualitative research. Quantitative research is based on measurement of quantity or amount. It is applicable to phenomena that can be expressed in terms of quantity, which we can measure. Whereas qualitative research is concerned with qualitative phenomena, that is phenomena relating to or involving quality or kind, which we cannot measure in terms of quantity. Conceptual or empirical research. Conceptual research is related to some abstract ideas or theory, where it is generally used by philosophers and thinkers to develop new concepts or to reinterpret existing ones. Whereas empirical research relies on experience or observation alone. It is data-based research coming up with conclusions which are capable of being verified by observation or experiment. Based on the time period, research can be one-time research where it is confined to a single time period or longitudinal research where research is carried on over several time periods. Depending on the environment, research can be three types. Field setting research where the research is carried out in a field or a community. Second is the laboratory research which is conducted under lab conditions. And third is the simulation research where we replicate or where we create a natural process or where we simulate a natural process. Okay. Now coming to clinical or diagnostic research. This research follows case study methods or in-depth approaches to reach the basic causal relations. This research go deep into the causes of things or events that interest us using very small samples and very deep probing data gathering devices. It attempts to identify, examine and analyze problems to determine their causes. Exploratory research. This research is conducted to have a better understanding of the existing research problem but will not provide conclusive results. What does it mean? It is used when we need to gain familiarity with a phenomenon or to acquire new insight into it in order to formulate a more precise problem or to develop a hypothesis. So basically we cannot test hypothesis in exploratory research. Okay, We can lead to an hypothesis. The object of the research is the development of hypothesis rather than their testing. Okay, So it is also known as formulative research. Historical research is the process of investigating and studying past events, people and societies using a variety of sources and methods. It aims to reconstruct and interpret the past based on the available evidence. It uses historical sources like documents, remains to study events or ideas of past including the philosophy of persons and groups at any remote point of time. It relies on both primary and secondary data sources including unpublished material. Now coming to conclusion or decision oriented research. In conclusion oriented research, researcher is free to pick up a problem, redesign the inquiry as he proceeds and is prepared to conceptualize as he wishes. Whereas in decision oriented research, it is always for the need of a decision maker 
and the researcher in this case is not free to embark upon research according to his own inclination. In this case, the freedom is restricted in decision-oriented research, whereas in conclusion-oriented research, researcher is free to do everything. Okay. Now coming to research approach, there are basically two types of research approach. One is quantitative approach and other is qualitative approach. Quantitative approach involves the generation of data in quantitative form which can be subjected to rigorous quantitative analysis in a formal and rigid fashion. This approach can be further subclassified into three types. One is inferential where we can infer the characteristics of a population and second is experimental where we manipulate the variables to see the effect of those variables on other variables. And third is the simulation approaches where we create an artificial environment, okay, where we simulate a particular process. Whereas in qualitative approach, it is concerned with the subjective assessment of attitudes, opinions and behavior. In qualitative research, results are generated in non-quantitative form or in the form which are not subjected to rigorous quantitative analysis. For example, focus group interviews, projective techniques and in-depth interviews where we are trying to do the subjective assessment of attitudes, opinions and behavior of the population. Now, let's see the difference between research methods and research methodology. Research methods basically refers to the methods the researcher uses in performing research operations. Okay, All those methods which are used by the researcher during studying his research problem are termed as research methods. But research methodology is a way to systematically solve the research problem. It may be understood as a science of studying how research is done scientifically. In it, we study the various steps that are generally adopted by a researcher in studying his research problem along with the logic behind them. So basically, in methods, we usually think about only methods. But whereas in methodology, we need to know the logic behind those methods also. Okay? For example, which of these methods or techniques are relevant and which are not relevant? And what would they mean and indicate and why? So these are some logics, you know, which we need to question ourselves while doing the research. Whatever research we do, uh, we need to support our research with a scientific method. Scientific method is the pursuit of truth as determined by logical considerations. And the ideal of science is to achieve a systematic interrelation of facts. Scientific methods attempt to achieve this ideal by experimentation, observation, logical arguments from accepted postulates and a combination of these three in varying proportions. Now coming to research process or steps, there are various steps in conducting research. To begin with, we need to first define the research problem, then we need to do the literature review, next we need to formulate hypothesis, after that we need to design research and we need to design the sample as well, after that data collection followed by data analysis and interpretation and the report. Now let's look into each of them briefly. Basically, the first step in a scientific inquiry is the formulation of a general topic into a specific research problem. Essentially, two steps are involved in formulating the research problem. One is understanding the problem thoroughly and rephrasing the same into meaningful terms from an analytical point of view. After defining the research problem, we need to do extensive literature survey connected with the problem. For this purpose, the abstracting and indexing journals and published or unpublished bibliographies are the first place to go to. Academic journals, conference proceedings, government reports, books must be tapped depending on the nature of the problem. Now coming to the third step, formulating hypothesis. Basically, hypothesis is a tentative assumption made in order to draw out and test its logical or empirical consequences. The role of the hypothesis is to guide the researcher by delimiting the area of research and to keep him on the right track. It sharpens his thinking and focuses attention on the more important facets of the problem. It also indicates the type of data required and the type of methods of data analysis to be used in the research. Now coming to the fourth step which is very important, research design. It is the conceptual structure within which research would be conducted. It facilitates research to be as efficient as possible, yielding maximal information. The function of the research design is to provide for the collection of relevant evidence with minimal expenditure of effort, time and money. We need to consider few things while preparing the research design. They are the means of obtaining the information, the availability and skills of the researcher and his staff, 
explanation of the way in which selected means of obtaining information will be organized and the reasoning leading to the selection and the time available for research and the last one the cost factor relating to research that is the finance available for the purpose of research. Now coming to the fifth step that is sample design. A sample design is a definitive plan determined before any data are collected for obtaining a sample from a given population. Samples can be either probability samples or non-probability samples. With probability samples, each element has a non-probability of being included in the sample, but the non-probability samples do not allow the researcher to determine this probability. There are different types of sampling. We will look into each of them very briefly. To start with deliberate sampling or purposive sampling, it is a non-probability sampling technique where we deliberately select units of the population constituting a sample which represents the population. When population elements are selected for inclusion in the sample, based on the ease of access, we call it as convenient sampling. If researcher's judgment is used for selecting items which he considers as representative of the population, then we call it as judgment sampling. Simple random sampling, it is most commonly used. It is also known as chance sampling or probability sampling. In this, each and every item in the population has an equal chance of inclusion in the sample and each one of the possible samples in case of finite population has the same probability of being selected. And some of the examples are lottery method and random number table. And coming to systematic sampling, systematic sampling is used when sampling frame is available in the form of a list. Selection process starts by picking some random point in the list and then every nth element is selected until the desired number is secured. So we use random numbers to pick up the unit with which to start. For example, every 15th name on a list, every 10th house on one side of a street are some of the examples of systematic sampling. Stratified sampling. So if the population from which a sample is to be drawn does not constitute a homogeneous group in case of heterogeneous population, stratified sampling technique is applied so as to obtain a representative sample. Population is stratified into a number of non-overlapping subpopulations or strata and sample items are selected from each stratum. And if we randomly choose participants from the various strata, we call it as stratified random sampling. Quota sampling is a non-probability sampling technique we use quota sampling because in stratified sampling, the cost of taking random samples from individual strata is often so expensive so that interviewers are simply given quota to be filled from different strata. The actual selection of items for sample being left to the interviewer's judgment. This is called quota sampling and the size of the quota for each stratum is generally proportionate to the size of that stratum in the population. And the quota samples generally happen to be judgment samples as already said rather than random samples. So we call it as non-probability sampling technique. Now coming to cluster sampling. Cluster sampling involves grouping the population and then selecting the groups or the clusters rather than individual elements for inclusion in the sample. Here we focus on the groups instead of individuals. And area sampling. It is quite close to cluster sampling and is often talked about when the total geographical area of interest happens to be big one. Under area sampling, we first divide the total area into a number of smaller non-overlapping areas generally called geographical clusters. Then a number of these smaller areas are randomly selected and all units in these small areas are included in the sample. This is called area sampling. Multi-stage sampling. It is a further development of the idea of cluster sampling. This technique is meant for big inquiries extending to a considerably large geographical areas like an entire country. Under multi-stage sampling, the first stage may be to select large primary sampling units such as states, then districts, then towns and finally certain families within the towns. If the technique of random sampling is applied at all stages of multi-staging sampling, the sampling procedure is described as multi-stage random sampling. Now coming to sequential sampling, it is a complex sample design where the ultimate size of the sample is not fixed in advance but is determined according to mathematical decisions on the basis of information yielded as survey progresses. So this helps us to reduce sampling costs by reducing the number of observations needed for the study or research. 
Now after sample design coming to the next step of research process that is data collection. We collect data by observation through personal interview through telephone interviews or by mailing questionnaires or through schedules or enumerators. Enumerators are specially assigned to collect data from the participant through schedules. So after collecting data, we classify the raw data into some purposeful and usable categories. So this part come under the data analysis and we code the data during analysis stage and also we edit so that we can improve the quality of data for coding. So in data analysis, we do fre uh, frequency calculation, we do some tabulations and we apply some statistical techniques or statistical methods in data analysis phase. So after this, we do the interpretation and we form a report. So basically we explain the findings on the basis of some theory and we also try to arrive at generalizations or we can try to build a theory and we ultimately prepare a final report based on the findings which we have collected in our research. Thank you.